Thank you, Marta. Uh, founded a group called the Environmental and Climate Change Action Team here at Temple. We came together to form a group. Um, I'm going to get up the name of it. It was a short lived series with a long title. And that title was Conversations on Global Crises Voices of the Madison Jewish Community. And Joel gave the second lecture on that series on climate change and its consequences. And I should say, you can find this on the web, along with an interview of Joel by Marta. You can find this on the web, and it's got one of the best um, primers, I would say, in climate change that I've ever read or heard. Um, in this, Joel would try to bring together ideas about Torah and science and the environment and how we should act. And in particular, he starts off in this lecture by reading a very familiar passage from the Torah that I wanted to read to you. This is Robert Alter's translation pieced together. Let us make a human, God says, in our image, from humus from the soil. And God said to the humans, us, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and conquer it and hold sway over the fish of the sea and the fowls, the fowl of the heavens and every beast that crawls upon the earth. And I imagine... Joel goes on to discuss it. Let me just first say that Joel goes on to discuss this. And he asks, he does a double take. He asks, is this instruction a license for ecological irresponsibility? What Joel called the despot model. That is for nature to serve us. Or is it a call to stewardship as a central tenet of the environmental movement? You can imagine what Joel said. Right? Joel responded by saying, tries to persuade us that the future of the earth does lie in our hands and that we must indeed transition from the despot to the, to the steward. Sometimes I imagine what it would be like to bring together the writers of the Torah over a dinner, over an evening meal, J, P, E, D, all in the same room together. And I imagine Joel sitting at the end of the table getting to ask one question. And that mischievous smile that he had, he would say, so you wrote that God created the earth and all living things on it. And then you put humans in charge? What in God's name were you thinking? <laughs> so the writers huddled together, they were a little stunned, they held together and they say to Yael, which would have been Joel's name in Hebrew, Yael, they say, let me answer your question with another question. In your lifetime and your predecessors, what were you thinking when you polluted the air and warmed the planet and contaminated the seas and poisoned the rivers and so many uh, species disappeared over the face of the earth? And then, and then they would look down at their feet at the ground and say, what were you thinking about the past, present, and precarious future of the earth beneath our feet? What are you going to do to stop erosion of the soil and how will you prevent a world without soil? And Joel would have been delighted to say that our speaker today, Joel Hamilton, is the world's expert on this question and that she has written 
a manifesto, a call to action as an environmental advocate of our generation to bring us together to address this very question of world without soil. So many of you know Joe. Joe is the director of the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, a former science advisor, the president of Obama, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a Howard Hughes medical investigator. This is really the pinnacle of the world of academia. And Joe is really famous. But at Temple Bethel, we know Joe, we know Joe another way. Because Joe's father, Herb Handelsman, was a member of Torah study for many years. Herb was a psychoanalyst, and he taught us things about Moses and Abraham and Joseph that I don't think are repeated in many other Torah studies. All I can say is that you must have had some pretty wild conversations with their time yourself. It was really um, amazing. Um, I should, I'd like to end by saying, I, met, I first met Joe 30 years ago uh, when my wife Mary and I bought our first house in Madison from Joe. And I'm telling you this because the backyard, the backyard created by Joe was as close to the Garden of Eden as I will ever get. It had the plants and the shrubs and the sustainable plants, right? The, the, uh, the, nat the, the natural ones, the local ones, it, and the pond, you could just lose yourself in the back for hours at a time. And now I understand how sustainable that was. And now I can see the, uh, what really stood out, I think, was the, was the soil. It was fragrant and rich, and you could walk on it and feel that you were in a different place. So Joe, with her hands, knows of what she speaks. So it is my privilege to welcome Joe Handelsman as the 2024 lecturer, um, Joel Peterson lecturer at the Takuna Alum and the Environment. Please join me in welcoming. Well, thank you, Gil, for that embarrassing introduction. You know, when people say I'm famous, and then they start talking about Temple of Beth Allen in the same breath, I think, okay, maybe I'm famous elsewhere. I think I'm infamous here. <laughs> I, I will admit, in answer to your question about what we talked about at dinner, the first word I learned how to spell was psychoanalyst. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Anyway, thank you all for uh, having me here and for being here. And also for the years of intellectual stimulation that you provided my father. I heard about uh, the, the Torah group every every week. We would have lunch on Sundays, and I would hear what happened that Saturday. And uh, he thrived in that group. I don't know about the rest of you, and I don't want to hear about it, but <laughs> he absolutely uh, loved your group. So I appreciate that for the last years of his life. He um, he really needed that intellectual community and, and you gave it to him. Uh, so it's really an incredible honor. Thank you. To be the Joel Peterson lecturer. I only crossed paths briefly with Joel uh, when we were both uh, at EW. And but his reputation obviously is way larger than any memory I would have. Um, an amazing person and scholar and teacher and uh, the words of his mentees are some of the warmest and most grateful I've, I've ever heard. So I regret not knowing him and I think his loss at such a young age is just a tragedy for the whole community of people who knew him, those who didn't, the environmental community and the soil science community. Uh, I also, is, is it possible to move the, the thing? Not the, no, yeah, okay. But it, it's not urgent, but if you can. Um, I also just want to mention uh, that I want to honor one other person, uh, my mother, Blossom Handelsman, who uh, was as beautiful as her name, uh, Blossom. Uh, she was an incredibly warm, loving, brilliant woman, and 
And today would have been her 93rd birthday. And uh, she is the force that made me what I am today. And I will ever be grateful for that and miss her uh, for the rest of my life. I also want to acknowledge the Ho-Chunk people and the land that they stewarded for so many centuries before European Americans arrived. Uh, I think it's important to remember anywhere that we have appropriated land from Native Americans, but this is a particularly relevant context because of their relationship with the soil. Uh, they lived on the land for many centuries, and it was their stewardship of the land that led to the great prairie soils of Wisconsin, and I'll mention those again later. Uh, we've taken those soils that they so carefully stewarded and protected and taken away most of the prairie uh, of Wisconsin and damaged the soils. Um, so I think the soil itself should be the reminder of respect for the sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk people and also for the centuries of nurturing of the land on which we stand. One of the things that has always struck me about soil is the spiritual and, and religious relationship that humans have with it. And for years, I found many uh, symbols of soil and frankly, goddesses of soil. It, it tends to be a, a female deity in most religions throughout the, the world's religions. Uh, my favorite is uh, Eartha, who is the German goddess of soil, this little lady here. And uh, but there are many depictions of soil and it's clear that uh, there was a relationship with soil many, many uh, millennia back. Um, that is far deeper. And, and some of the questions I got from some of you, uh, I think touched on this, um, that people used to have a much deeper and more spiritual relationship with soil than they do today. And how do we regenerate and rebuild that relationship? For years, I actually couldn't find anything in the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition about soil. So, I mean, obviously that was pretty obvious today, but. Uh, I had trouble finding it. And then it was my father who mentioned, well, you know, Adam, if you remember the Hebrew school, he said in his way, <laughs> uh, Adam means soil in Hebrew. And of course, I realized that the entire uh, Genesis story was based on soil, and I should have known that. But I also found this great quote um, years, uh, years ago that says that, uh, I won't be able to read this, but the Lord hath created medicines out of the earth, and he that is wise shall not abhor them. And that's the Bible's mention of penicillin and the first antibiotics, which most of our antibiotics come from soil. Uh, and then your group, your book group, was kind enough to generate an incredible list of the hundreds of mentions of soil in uh, the Torah, and I uh, have that list and will be um, using that and many things I write in the future. So thank you for that. So today I wanted to keep my talk somewhat short uh, so that we have plenty of time for questions because I gather most of you, many of you have read the book in, uh, in, in some detail. So I don't want to repeat what you've already read. But for those who haven't read it, I'll give a quick summary of some of the key points about soil and its loss and what we're facing in terms of a crisis and the imminence of that crisis, and then talk about uh, soil protection and how societies have protected soil, how we can protect soil. We know how to do this. See, this is a happy crisis. Unlike climate, where I don't think anyone really knows what we should all do. With soil, we have the solutions in hand. We just have to enact them. And that is obviously a tall order, but it's better than not knowing what the answer is and then having to enact whatever that answer is. We only have half the equation here. I'll talk about soil protection and then some of the actions um, that we each can promote or that our government can promote uh, to save soil and preserve it for our next uh, generation. And in that section, I will try to answer some of the questions that uh, your book group sent to me, which were really great and insightful. So one of the key aspects of soil that is critical to understanding the soil crisis and what goes on around us every day that we never think about is that soil forms very, very slowly. 
So it's a millennial process that starts with geologic material, minerals, the basis of soil is rock and uh, the bedrock and minerals that are on top of it. And then and those are processed by plants, animals, and mostly microorganisms. And that ultimately over many, many centuries uh, of climate and, um, and all the water and oxygen, lack of oxygen, the chain of chemical changes that occur, the physical changes that occur lead to soil. And so that is a, typically a very long process. But once the soil is formed, it's actually not that hard to build it up from there. If you lose all the soil, then you have to start from scratch. And that's when the long process occurs. And that's why I think this is such a critical crisis. Because if we lose it, then we're starting from scratch. And we're starting with uh, land that looks something like this. So the, the picture on the left is a picture of very young soil. And you can see there's no differentiation in the layers. On the right is a very old soil. And this is what we see in a typical mature soil where you get the layers that have been changed by the physical, chemical, and biological processes that act on the soil. And you see all of the colors and shapes and textures that result in the layers of soil. That is a mature and typically very stable soil and generates a topsoil, which is really what we're going to be talking about today, that top brown and living layer of soil uh, that is quite robust. And so if we look at how slow that process is, the scary balance to that is that we only form uh, soil at 0.5 tons per acre per year, so half a ton per acre per year. And that may not mean anything now, but remember the numbers, we'll come back to it. I'm sure when I ask what does soil do for us, everyone immediately thinks that, well, we produce food in it. I hope everyone thinks that. Uh, that typically is the answer. And absolutely, the abundance of food on Earth is due to the soil. 95% of our food comes either directly or indirectly from the soil. And we know how to grow a few crops hydroponically. That's not a sustainable way to feed the human uh, species. And we do get some, about 5% of our nutrition from the oceans. That also will probably never sustain us. So for the moment, we're kind of stuck eating soil. And so we better protect it if we want to eat. But soil does much more for us. One of the key things that most people don't realize is that soil is the largest water filter on Earth. If you think of the water that starts on the surface, you know, muddy pools of water, and then what ends up in the groundwater, which is what's pumped up in places like Madison for us to drink, there's quite a difference there. You wouldn't want to drink the muddy puddles from the surface, but groundwater tends to be quite safe. And the process that happens in between is the filtration of that water through soil. And the chemical, physical, and biological properties of soil give the water its cleanliness by the time it gets to the bottom. Soil is also the home to more biodiversity than any other habitat on Earth. Thousands and thousands of species. My lab's actually tried to do estimates, and we can't even estimate the number of species per gram of soil because there are so many that the best we could do was between 4,000 and 40,000 per gram, which is a pretty um, pathetic esti estimate. It's a pretty, pretty broad range. But that gives you a sense of the incredible diversity and what we will lose when we lose that soil. And that's just thinking of the microorganisms. There are my, uh, microbial um, uh, larger organisms like worms, there are macroorganisms, big worms, insects, and of course, mammals that live in the soil. And of course, plants are one of the important uh, collaborators with the microbes to create soil. Antibiotics, about three quarters of our antibiotics in current use came from soil organisms, and we are still discovering from uh, soil organisms, and carbon storage. And when I was in the White House, it was fascinating to me because even though climate change was the most common topic anyone talked about, because the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy was John Holman, who had spent most of his career preparing for this position, 
in order to protect the climate. And he was just a fantastic advocate and, and uh, knowledgeable uh, expert on climate change. And despite his passion and President Obama's passion for climate, they never wanted to talk about soil. And I kept bringing it up many, many times. And it was this uphill battle because they wanted to talk about the oceans and they wanted to talk about trees. And they never wanted to talk about soil. But in fact, the carbon in soil is enormously significant. So there's 2,500 billion tons of carbon in soil. That's a lot of carbon. And to give you a sense of scale, it's three times the amount of carbon in the entire atmosphere. So if you took all of the atmospheric carbon around the Earth, that would be only a third of what we find in soil. That's a lot of a lot of carbon and pretty significant to that equation of what ends up in greenhouse gas and what doesn't. And it's four or five times as much carbon as is in all the trees and plants across the earth added up together. So for all of the fuss that people make, and I'm not belittling plants, I love them, but for all of the attention that the plants and the trees get, what about the soil? We're actually storing way more carbon in soil than we are in plants. And it's also a much more vulnerable source of carbon uh, because it can be disturbed and, and released as atmospheric gases much more easily. And that's been demonstrated quite abundantly in agricultural soils. Since the 1850s, we have lost about half of the carbon that was once in our agricultural soils, probably to the atmosphere. It has gone other places, but most of it probably in the atmosphere. So that's a lot of carbon, one that we've lost, but also it's an incredible repository for carbon that has space, has capacity to take up more carbon. So why aren't we talking about the potential of soil to address aspects of climate? And why aren't we doing more to think about how we're losing our soil? So soil is eroding across the world. This is an example from Africa, but people, of course, love to say that's something other people do, not us. Well, in fact, in this country, soil has been protected by law since the Dust Bowl, and FDR uh, brought in fabulous legislation and was a passionate soil advocate, partly because of the tutelage of Ola Leopold from Wisconsin, uh, who personally went to the White House and told the president just how important soil was and got Franklin uh, Roosevelt to invest heavily in soil research. And Wisconsin became the site of some of the first conservation research led by Aldo Leopold up in Coon Valley, where there were steep soils that had been eroded in a very short period of time after agriculture had begun. And their, uh, their rivers were all silted and cloudy, the trout were dying, and all of Leopold instigated a very simple plan for protecting that soil. And the rivers came back, the trout came back, and the health of the ecosystem was restored. And so that led to the 1930s first legislation to protect soil, as well as the Soil Conservation Service, which is still alive and well, today under a new name. So why after, what is it, 80, 90 years of protecting soil and having a very robust soil conservation movement, do we uh, lose our soil at very high rates? And the USDA itself, which does not want to talk about this, I discovered when I was in the White House, uh, that was another uphill battle, simply getting the USDA to talk about soil loss they, uh, even they, will admit that we are losing soil at about, on average, across our land, five tons per acre per year. Well, remember I said that soil is formed at half a ton per acre per year, and the half ton is very generous. I use as conservative uh, uh, statistics as I can so that the USDA doesn't come after me, because when I was in the White House, they would pick on anything I said about soil loss and start nitpicking the details. So it's probably way less than 0.5 tons per acre per year. But even if it were 0.5, that's one uh, tenth the rate at which we're losing soil, and that's obviously not sustainable. 
So we're losing our soil and we're doing um, surprisingly little about it. So when I was in the White House, we did some calculations to ask <clears throat> what would we, uh, how long would we have soil if it were eroding at the rate that USDA said, half a ton per acre per year. And although um, it certainly is not sustainable, I mean, you can see this is using an, just an average uh, Iowa farm, uh, which might start at a thousand tons per acre. If we eroded at about half a ton per acre per year, uh, you can see that you know it'd be about a hundred years before we were at the halfway point of losing about half the soil, and that's a critical point because that's when people start to see a reduction in crop yields is when the soil gets to be about half the depth that it was. Many of our soils are only there or below it. So we're already experiencing in this country and around the world experiencing that soil loss. But we also knew that this was the best case scenario, that 100 years is not sustainable, but it certainly is not tomorrow. And people in Congress would tell me, oh, we'll figure out another way to grow food by then. And I just, I don't think the, 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 the biomass uh, works for that equation. I just don't think there are other ways um, to uh, grow food without soil. And so we started looking at some other scenarios. If we were losing soil at 25 tons per acre, 50 tons, 100 tons per acre per year, how fast would we be out of soil or at that uh, important 500 or 50% mark? And then the news gets pretty alarming because if you look at uh, even a middling rate, which is 25 tons per acre per year, by 2060, we would be out of soil. And by 2040, we would be uh, hitting the halfway point. And you can see it gets worse as it goes on. Now, some of our land in the United States is already at that point, we're at zero. I mean, we do not have topsoil. And I think I, uh, for the sake of time, I'm not showing it, but when you fly over, for example, Iowa, you can see bare spots where there's no soil left. If you're looking at subsoil and the rocky substrate with no topsoil visible. So we're already there in some cases, but on average, we would be there with all of our soil if we were eroding at 25 tons per acre. So what are the realistic numbers? <clears throat> if half a ton per acre per year is optimistic, why do I, I have great concern about these other numbers? Well, first, we have numbers that show that many of our soils are eroding way faster than USDA's half a ton per acre per year. No question. We're losing soil on many, many lands. Um, I'm sorry, five tons per acre per year. Um, <clears throat> they we're losing soil at 10 and 20 uh, tons per acre per year on much of our Midwestern soils. Any soil with a small amount of slope that is not being preserved with some of the methods we'll talk about later is losing soil at these higher rates. And what's scarier is that as climate change advances, we're seeing more and more violent storms. In these very severe sun thunderstorms, we've all seen them in the Midwest, the increased frequency of these storms with very high velocity raindrops, which damage the soil structure and then make it easier for it to wash away. And wash away in gullies and rivulets and all sorts of different routes, but take it off the land. Uh, those storms are becoming far more frequent. They used to sort of cluster around a mean from 1900 to 1950. Since then, there's been a steady rise, and there's no going back from this, in uh, the frequency of those severe weather storm, rainstorms. And those are only increasing in frequency. So that means that soil erosion is going to increase. And in Iowa, when I was in the White House, there was a measurement of over 10,000 acres of Iowa soil eroding at 50 tons per acre in one storm, in one storm. So one afternoon took away the equivalent of what the USDA says um, is would be 10 times the average soil loss. And so the more we see those storms, the faster the soil loss, and those more aggressive numbers at 
25, 50, and 100 tons per acre per year start looking very realistic. And that is frightening because that's in uh, our lifetimes and uh, particularly the lifetimes of our children. So what's going to happen when we have that level of loss? We've already seen all of this, and so there's there's no guessing about it. These are these are absolutely known outcomes. Obviously, crop yield reductions are the first thing we think of. We're going to be producing less food on the same land. We have people say, well, we'll breed crops and they'll be more productive. Well, in fact, many of our crops are leveling off in terms of the amount that they will yield. And plant breeding will only take them so far, and in many cases, we may not be able to push them any further. And so uh, we may not be able to compensate for that loss of soil. Some people say, well, we'll just dump more fertilizer on. It turns out that's not sufficient. It's not environmentally sound, but it's also not sufficient to compensate for the loss of soil. Soil is more than just a bunch of nitrogen and phosphorus for plants. There's less buffering when we have degraded soils. So the result is that when it rains, we have those very large rainstorms, there's more flooding. When we have those summer droughts, there's more drought because the soil has less holding capacity for the water. So it doesn't act as a sponge anymore. It doesn't hold the water and then release it as the plants need it. There's less land because the land just becomes useless to feed what will be a much larger uh, population in 2050. We're expecting about 10 billion people to need food. We're thinking that the food needs will close to double by then. Where are we going to be growing that food if we have less productive land? Less land and less productive land. We'll be losing our water filter. So what will happen to our groundwater and the contaminants that the soil currently takes out? We'll be losing much biodiversity and uh, be included among that. How many microbes that produce antibiotics will no longer be on Earth? We'll probably never know how many we've already lost and uh, how many we could lose. But we do know that some antibiotics have only been found once in the entire world with all of the millions and millions of uh, uh, bacterial samples from soil that have been tested across the world by drug companies for about 60 years. Some have only been found one time. So the question is, if that soil where we found, for example, vancomycin had been eroded and we just didn't have that microbe, would we have vancomycin today? And how many others have disappeared or will disappear? And the carbon emission and pollution over waterways will be tremendous because as the soil erodes, it's more uh, likely to release its um, carbon as greenhouse gases. And it also uh, releases its nutrients into waterways and causes, for example, the dead zone in the, in the um, Gulf of Mexico, which is fed by the Mississippi River from the farmland of the Midwest. So a, a direct outcome of soil erosion and the loss of nutrients from our farms in the Midwest is 7,900 square miles of dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico where they're no longer living organisms. So a few examples of what, what we're in for. And this will hit as, you know, it's not like it's gonna hit uh, drastically. I think we will reach this point of crisis in a re relatively short period of time because we started farming from the Midwest about the same time on much of the soil. And within a few decades, a lot of this land was settled and we started eroding that soil around the same time. And so a lot of that soil will give out and start being uh, highly uh, compromised in its ability to produce food around the same time. It's interesting, when I was in the White House, I, I tried to work on the Gulf of Mexico problem, and I found that the EPA had set a goal of 2016 to have the, um, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico by working with farmers in the Midwest. And in that time, I think they gave themselves something like eight years. In that time, by 2016, the dead zone had increased in size. So we can't even stop it from growing, let alone remediate it. So what are we gonna do if we keep 
simply adding uh, to the dead zones. That's just another food source. The shellfish and uh, other fish from the Gulf of Mexico uh, are severely compromised as both uh, members of the ecosystem, but also of our food supply. So why does, why does soil erode? That's what everyone wants to know. What have we been doing all these years that, for example, the Native Americans didn't, and any society that has lasted for thousands of years in the same place with agriculture has uh, has not done. What are we doing that destroys our soil? And it's pretty simple. We plow, we plant annual crops with small root systems, really pathetic root systems. I'll show you some. And we don't use cover crops. And those are the three things that we can undo quite easily. So let me just show you what that entails. <laughs> So the first thing we did was we introduced the plow. And it was, in fact, Thomas Jefferson's plow and ultimately John Deere's plow that made it possible to break the soil of the Midwest and ultimately turn it into the agricultural, uh, uh, productive, pro produ agriculturally productive land that it is today. That plow, the original plow that did that, is called the moldboard plow. This is an example on the left here. And it has this ability to scoop up the soil very deeply and then flip it over. And the result is that it destroys the, the structure of the soil. And instead of having clods like you see on, on the right here, you know, a handful of soil that hangs together in a, in a nice clump, we end up with single particles, sand particles, clay particles, silt particles, and those wash away very easily. It also ends up compressing the soil, makes the soil less healthy, it's harder for worms to get through it, many, many other things happen. But the main thing is it makes the soil much more erodible. So the same implement that made it possible to turn the Midwest into the so-called breadbasket of, of the country, uh, also destroyed the, the very thing that made that possible, which were these rich, deep prairie soils that were formed from centuries of being allowed to be prairies with only uh, bison and other animals uh, 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 roaming on them. So those prairies covered, just for example, Wisconsin, about a third of Wisconsin before European Americans came. And that was protected by uh, the Native American people who lived here. Now we're down to about uh, less than 6% of Wisconsin is in prairie. So not only have we destroyed soils, but we are also destroying our soil producing capacity because it was the prairies that gave rise to those incredible um, soils. And this is how they did it. We've bred our plants, our crop plants, to have very, very small, uh, very fine root systems. This is an example uh, of native switchgrass, which grows in our prairies. And you can see from uh, the height of the person in comparison that uh, these roots will get up to three meters in length. So they go deep, deep, deep into the soil. They are tremendous, and they live there for years because they're perennial. They come back every year. The job of a perennial plant is to put its carbon into the roots because it has to store its energy for the next year. In contrast, the job of corn plant is to uh, produce seed. And so while corn plant is pumping all of its carbon and other nutrients into that cob that we then harvest, the root system, which is tiny, you can see it can be as small as a few inches deep, is leaving very little carbon behind. So at the end of the season, a corn plant will have left about 1% of its carbon in the soil, 1%. And a lot of that by the next season will, will be gone. In contrast, most prairie plants will leave about 70% of their carbon in the soil because at the end of the season, rather than putting all their energy into producing an ear of corn, they're pumping their carbon down to make their roots healthy for the next year. While those roots are getting healthy, they're not just building themselves, they're releasing massive amounts of carbon into the soil. So about a third of the carbon that plants fix using photosynthesis ends up in the soil, which on the face of it sounds kind of wasteful, Photosynthesis is a very costly process for plants. Why in the world would they go to all the trouble 
to use the energy of the sun to fix that carbon, put it in their roots, and then just release it. Well, clearly they're doing that for a highly evolved reason, and that's to feed the microorganisms that live around the roots and that generate the substances that stick soil together and make soil healthy. So it's that relationship that we've destroyed by breeding plants that look like this corn plant root uh, here. So we plow, we plant annual plants that take everything from the soil and don't put anything back. One of my colleagues in Iowa uh, says that for every pound of corn he harvests, he believes uh, that he harvests about a pound of soil. So if you do that equation, that's a pretty, pretty scary uh, rate of soil loss. And then the last thing we do is we don't give our, our soil cover. We should be blanketing our soil in the winter. And for winters like this, where we don't have a lot of snow cover, if you fly over the Midwest, you see land like this all the time, just bare brown land that often has been plowed in the fall. So in addition to harvesting all the plant material off that land, then we've plowed it and turned it over. It smells great. We all love the smell of fresh plowed um, land. But I call that one of the guilty pleasures of life because that plowing is making it that much more vulnerable to all the forces of weather um, that come along and take the soil away. Instead, we should be using cover crops and cover crops live over the winter. I'll show you an example in, in a minute. And the, the combination is that we've created this perfect storm of soil damage and soil loss. So we've plowed our soils that were left intact in place for centuries. Now we've turned them over and exposed them and broken them up. We've monocropped with annual crops that have these tiny root systems and take and don't give to the soil. And then we haven't given the soil uh, the protective cover of cover crops in the winter. And that's just not a natural situation. We've created a severely unnatural, vulnerable situation for our soil. And then on top of it, we've created this phenomenon we know of as climate change that has increased the frequency of storms um, that take the soil away and erode it. So that combination uh, has, is, is new. I mean, we've always been eroding soil. It's a natural process. But the rate at which it's happening is new. And we know that societies that have collapsed, many of them have collapsed over uh, thousands of years of history because of exploitation of the soil. And there's a really good uh, analysis of this, that the average society that exploits its soil and doesn't regenerate it will last about 250 years. Now, well, think about how old we are. That's, that's a scary number. But there are societies that have lived happily, health, healthily for themselves and promoted their soil for thousands of years. My favorite example is on the left, the Maya. There are still Maya, despite the fact that everyone thinks they're extinct. The Maya people are still uh, living, small numbers of them, of course, but they're uh, living a very healthy agricultural life in Central America and Mexico. And they have done that for, it's thought, about 4,500 years on the very same land. And that's because they know how to steward the soil. And there's some evidence that many of these societies actually create more soil than the surrounding natural lands that are untouched. That they know so well how to generate soil carbon and increase the topsoil that the, the soil actually becomes deeper, richer, and healthier as a result of their agricultural practices. Even in marginal land, like the arid southwest, the Zuni Indians figured out all sorts of soil conservation methods so that they could grow crops, which European Americans couldn't. They tried and tried and tried, and they finally had to go to the uh, Zuni and ask them, how do you do this? Because we can't get anything to grow. It's too hot and, and dry. The Zuni methods kept uh, them in agricultural products for uh, many centuries uh, until most of them were um, displaced from their land. So we know that it's possible. Every continent has a great indigenous people. We call them indigenous because they've been there longer than these recent migrants. 
And that means they've been finding a way to live. And very, very, very few of them are hunter-gatherers. Most of them are agricultural societies. And they have lasted as agricultural societies because they know how to steward their soil. And so what can we do in modern agriculture? We obviously have to maintain our levels of production given the world's population, but that's not really a challenge. We know how to do that. We can first go to no-till planting. That's a method that was developed in the United States when I was a student in agronomy um, in the 70s. Um, I thought the soil problems were solved because no-till planting had just been announced and it was, it was said to be the thing that will save our soils, will no longer be eroding soil. But in the United States, what I really didn't notice for a while was it didn't catch on. Brazil is up to two thirds of its land in no-till. The US hasn't even reached a third of its land in no-till. So we have methods and we don't use them. Cover cropping, we should be avoiding the eight months in Wisconsin, varies by climate of course, but in Wisconsin about eight months of the fallow land, just exposed bare land. We need to uh, be planting cover crops and increasing the organic matter, the, the plant material, the carbon. And we need to have mixed plantings and rotations, which is an old uh, Native American method that we need to copy. So this is an example as opposed to the moldboard plow with those big scoops that would turn the soil over. This is a no-till planter <clears throat> that will drill the seeds into the soil without disturbing it. Instead of having bare land like this, we can have lush land like this. Farms will plant, this is an example of uh, uh, winter rye, which is a plant that's planted after the main harvest. So you, you harvest your corn or whatever your main crop is in the fall and then plant the rye. And it comes up and it forms uh, these beautiful um, <clears throat> areas that enrich the soil. It leaves enormous amounts of carbon behind. It's one of the more productive uh, carbon fixers, and it has a really great effect on the soil. The winter rye can even be harvested, it can be incorporated into the soil, it can be left in place, lots of things you can do with it. Um, sometimes it's even planted just between rows because it's so uh, beneficial uh, to the soil and nourishes the soil so well. In Iowa, a wonderful um, uh, professor, Lisa Schulte Moore, who actually recently got the MacArthur Genius Award, or so it's called, uh, for this work, developed a very simple method, and the data from it is, is so impressive that it has convinced farmers to change to this method. Her method is that we know that in new cropping and mixed cropping, those mixtures of perennial plants are the best thing we could be doing for the soil. So she said, well, what if we just take 10% of our corn out of production? I think most farmers could afford 10% for the benefits you would get from this and replace that corn uh, with strips like you see here in the upper right, of mixed plantings of deep rooted perennials that build the soil. And she found that simply doing that would reduce soil erosion by 95%. And then over several years, you do that, you know, rotate it across your land, it increases the nutrients in the soil, reduces the fertilizer costs, and reduces the vulnerability of the soil to floods, droughts, and all the things that damage uh, the soil in, uh, in enormous catastrophic ways. And so this seems like the obvious thing. We'll talk about why obvious isn't always easy. Uh, but this was a tremendous boon to, uh, to soil uh, conservation. She and her colleagues in Extension are now teaching this method across the state of Iowa I think it's being adopted beyond that. But to me, this is one of the most uh, aggressive revolutions because with just 10%, farmers do the same things on the rest of the land. They can just deal with 10% of the land being in mixed uh, perennials and regenerate the soil. So what are some of the other ways that we can protect the soil and bring some of our soils back? Um, you may have seen this article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. 
um, that golf courses are beginning to be uh, a, a thing of excess in this country. We have 16,000 golf courses nationwide. That's more golf courses than McDonald's. Um, that's 1.5 billion gallons of water a day being put into our golf courses. Of course, many of them are on marginal lands that are quite dry and uh, where we can ill afford to be pumping that kind of water from uh, the, the, the earth. Uh, and that's more, almost half of the golf courses in the world. We have more than any other country and uh, almost as many as all of the other countries put together. But today, golf courses are in oversupply. So across the country, there are golf courses that are closing. And in some cases, you see places, there was one in uh, New Hampshire that recently closed that Target bought, and they built a big distribution warehouse. That's not a particularly good use of the land, uh, but that's what would happen. Well, there are other places that are taking a very thoughtful approach to this, and they're saying these are large tracts of land. We could bring back soil, the biodiversity, the carbon fixation, and a connection with the land. And we call this the rewilding process. They have turned into these lands of the work offerings back into wild lands, repopulated the plants that were once there. Uh, the animals are starting to come back. Biologists are studying how long it takes, and it's remarkable how quickly the biodiversity starts to regenerate. So this is just one example of ways that people are really taking advantage of uh, the enormous amount of land in this country. It's not like we're, we have a shortage of land uh, that is used for other things that could be used for rebuilding uh, soil, uh, helping climate change, and um, in increasing biodiversity. And I think this is an example that uh, is an answer to one of the questions somebody in the book group asked. Well, you know, what what would we be doing to make a better connection between people and the land and the soil? And these places are, are really documenting how people come through and they, they walk, they bird watch, they smell the soil, they look at the plants, they see the beautiful blooming uh, perennials, and they begin to have a new appreciation of nature. And of course, you know, golf courses based on where they are are usually near urban or suburban populations. And so they have a lot of exposure to people uh, or people to them. Something happened here. So. Uh, I know what happened. Oh, when you touch the screen and mess with the Zoom, then it's oh, okay. Try now. Here we go. Thank you. So, what are some of the other things that we could be doing as a society? So, the first thing I tried when I was at the White House, um, one, of, one of the many things that didn't work, was uh, I tried to change crop insurance. And that was probably the most useless effort I've ever put in. I looked a lot from it. <laughs> but crop insurance it made so much sense because crop insurance is one of the big motivators for farmers. So I found out that the reason farmers weren't adopting the 10%, the strip cropping that I told you about, was that if they take 10% out of, the, of their corn out of production and put it into these strips, well, they're losing 10% of their crop insurance. Well, that, that's disastrous. They, they, can't, they cannot afford that. The margins in agricultural productivity and, and profitability are so small. No farmer can avoid, can, can afford a 10% reduction in crop insurance. They lose the whole crop, then they only get 90% of what they would predict the, the crop is worth. That was unacceptable. So I asked the people in Iowa what would make the difference, and they said, well, if, if Crop insurance are structured differently, that would do it. So I immediately got on that. And I thought, well, this is easy. You pay the soil, the, the farmers, to build the soil. And you reduce their crop insurance premiums, which are quite costly, a significant part of uh, their input costs. You reduce their costs according to how healthy their soils are. And you watch the soil health or soil carbon over time. And as the health improves, their premiums go down. Well, why is that going to work out? It works out perfectly because as the soil carbon increases, that will reduce the vulnerability of the crops to flooding and drought damage. 
So you'll have less catastrophic crop loss, less fewer payouts from the crop insurance. The government and the banks that get together and form the crop insurance units will end up with more profit. The farmers will have an incentive uh, to keep their soil healthy. Our incentives don't work that way. We have these per absolutely perverse disincentives to nurture the soil. So I still think crop insurance is a big way to do it, but three years in the White House, we've known we're long enough, near long enough to uh, change crop insurance. It was long enough to learn why it's hard. Um, and the uh, subsidies we pay are often for the wrong foods. We subsidize corn. Farmers get the highest uh, uh, premium for corn from any crop they can grow, in, at least in the Midwest. And so they keep growing corn and corn and corn. And even though they know they should be rotating with soybeans or some other plants, they'll kind of push the corn yet another year because their profits are going to be higher if they're selling corn from that land than if they're selling soybeans. And so it's kind of hard as a farmer to go in and plant a plant that you know is going to give you less income that year. Um, but that's, of course, the right thing to do. Well, we could be paying for that as a society. Instead, we prop up the prices of corn and we make every incentive toward just growing continuous corn. We should be working now on some of these ideas like crop insurance or subsidizing the right crops and the right practices. Uh, for the 2028 Farm Bill. The 2023 Farm Bill, too late for that. We don't know what's going to be in it, but I guarantee it's not going to be revolutionary. Um, <clears throat> there are a few good things I've heard that will support soil, but it's not a major change from uh, what we uh, have now. But every five years, we pass another Farm Bill, and it's time to start working on the next one. Tammy Baldwin used to be on the committee that wrote the Farm Bill. She's no longer, but I'm sure we can find um, senators and uh, members of Congress to work with us. We could uh, be preparing for COP29. It's coming up quickly, and I'll tell you about a group that is working on uh, soil as a topic. Uh, for COP29, the climate talks in, um, I think they're in Azerbaijan this year. Um, soil has not been able to be put on the agenda. So in COP26, I was actually just finishing my, writing my book, and I worked really hard with some colleagues across the world, all consortium, to get just a simple symposium on soil. They wouldn't put it in the main program of COP26. So it was called satellite. Well, of course, only the people interested in soil came in. It really, I'm sure it didn't do any good. We just talked to it ourselves. Um, but if we try now, perhaps in COP29, we can get it on the agenda. In the last COP, there actually was some conversation about soil. There, I think there's really been some dramatic change uh, in, in discussions about climate at these meetings in the last couple of years. And I think COP29 offers some interesting uh, options and possibilities. I think one of our, our big ways of getting consumers involved is having a, a label, like the organic label that we have for food, but this would be a soil safe label. And some people say, well, that's not really very sexy. People aren't going to buy food that says soil safe, <laughs> but they would if you called it climate safe. People would love to do anything they can to walk in a grocery and feel like when they buy the cucumber, they're buying a little bit of climate change protection. I think that would make people feel just right. And so I think that's a great uh, strategy to have soil safe uh, food, which would then have a premium that was fed back to the farmers and pay the cost of the practices that they would need to adopt in order to protect their soil. There are some ideas about getting a consumer coalition together to do that. It would take getting uh, obviously consumer groups, uh, the corn growers, all of the major crop groups, USDA and uh, probably crop insurance people all together to talk about this. I didn't want to think about that headache, but somebody has the energy to do that, even though I don't. <laughs> um, and I think we need to support some new research on soil. There, even though we know what to do, there are things we could certainly do better. We could get a bigger impact from the practices we change. 
So first of all, we need to be thinking about alternatives to annual crops. And there's a really interesting crop that I uh, only recently heard about, and I have not tried the bread from it yet, so I can't tell you how it tastes, but it is a plant called Kernza, which is a perennial wheat. So instead of being like the wheat plant, which is like the corn plant, which has small roots and takes out of the soil, doesn't put it back, Kernza has these massive root systems that feed the soil. And you don't have to disrupt it every year by digging it up and, and turning the soil over and planting. And it produces kernels that have something like a wheat-like structure. Those look something like uh, wheat kernels. And uh, people say that the bread that you can make from it is actually pretty good, and it doesn't have the gluten content that our wheat does, which is both good and bad. For people who can't eat gluten, that's a good thing. For people who like to make gluten bread, that's a problem. Uh, it's a problem, but we've worked that out. Um, we could be, uh, as individuals, those are some of the national things. As individuals, I think we just need to get soil into the conversation. So one of the things I, I always tell people is when you go to the farmer's market, talk to the farmers about their soil. Farmers love to talk about how they grow their crops. So I ask them, what kind of soil do you have? There are 22,000 types of soil in the world. We're not talking about one type of soil. So I'm sure they would love to tell you about their soil. What does their land look like? Is it sloped? Is it not? What do they do to regenerate their soil? How do they nurture their soil? Most of the organic farmers at the, uh, at the food co-ops and uh, farmers market would love to talk about those things, and they're always surprised when people know anything about it because most urban populations don't know the first thing. We could all be composting. Uh, about close to half the food that we buy in the grocery store never ends up being eaten, is wasted, and thrown out. So, sure. yeah. Right there, that's a food, that's a composting. Oh, look at that, great, all right. Well, I don't have to tell this group then, but congratulations. Yeah. Uh, but I'll still tell you, okay? Um, so participate in your local uh, composting effort. Um, but we could also be doing this uh, very effectively at home. Many of us struggle, rightfully so, with producing compost well and safely. If you make it wrong, you end up producing methane, which is a really bad greenhouse gas. So many people have said, let's let the experts do it. And in Madison, there are several really good companies that will pick up your compost and bring you an empty vessel. Um, Earth Stew and Green Box are just two examples. There are many others if you, if you look for them. But Middleton, a few weeks ago, made the big move that they are going to municipal composting, mm -hmm. which is actually going to be the law in California very soon. They passed this law a couple of years ago, and um, it's going to take, take uh, action. that Everyone has to compost, be against the law and not to compost, so they will turn it into a municipal function. Um, we should be going in that direction, but Middleton's already uh, started their way ahead. Uh, we should be lobbying Madison and every other major uh, city around here uh, to develop municipal food composting uh, because the good composters will do it most efficiently with the least methane production, and they'll make sure that that compost is used um, in ways that will be beneficial for the land. We could all be gardening more with trees and perennials that will nurture the soil and use the annuals a bit less. And we can pressure our municipalities to do that. So one of the ideas, if you've read the book you may have seen, is the idea of using strips in the median uh, sections of highways as places to plant perennials. When I was in the White House, I had a colleague who was big on the pollinator problem. He wanted to develop the Butterfly Highway, which was Highway 10 that goes from the northeastern U.S. down to Texas. It actually, one highway follows the monarch uh, butterfly migration route. And so he wanted to call it Butterfly Highway and plant it with all the pollinator crops. And I thought that was brilliant because not only would it enhance our pollinators, but it would also build our soil. Uh, the caretaking of these lands is less than it costs to mow the, the grasses that they currently have on many of the median crops, and they're also beautiful. They hold the soil in place, they build the soil, they flower, and they attract uh, um, the uh, pollinators. What more can you want? 
I also think somebody has to take on <clears throat> building an Earth city. So Earth cities are uh, something that does not exist yet, but is the obvious thing to uh, complement the tree city. So you may have noticed when you drive into some cities, there's a big sign that looks like that that says Tree City USA. And that is supported by the uh, Arbor Foundation, Arbor Day Foundation. We need the same thing, some other foundation, the Soil Foundation, uh, to do this for soil. So um, I was asking ChatGPT uh, to use AI <laughs> to develop some logos for our new uh, community. And I found a really interesting glitch that I had to tell ChatGPT about. If you notice, I, I think logos are gorgeous. Uh, I found that if you say please at the end of your request, it responds much better than they better <laughs> like it. And I, at first it gave me very green ones, and I said, well, could you emphasize the soil by using more rich brown? Uh, and it, it did that beautifully. And I said, vibrant colors, please. And it made the colors more vibrant. But a couple of times it left the Soil City USA off uh, the, like, the up upper right, um, it, it left the words off. I said, why did you do that? You left the words off. Then, if you look at the next one to the left, it's spelled city wrong. It has two eyes in the C. And then, if you look at the one on the up the far left, it's spelled USA wrong. And then, the one at the bottom, no T in the C. I said, what? I said, I think there's a little glitch in your brain. You can't seem to do the images and the words at the same time. What's up with you? And so I'm sorry to disappoint you. It wrote a very nice apology, but I couldn't seem to fix it. Uh, it's not good at fixing itself. And so he said, would you like to try again? And frankly, after six of these, I said, no, not really, because you're just going to get the spelling wrong again. But one of the things I found, I, I just think is so lovely about uh, chat GPT is he gives you a beautiful description of what it was trying to do with the image that it created. And I mean, look at this. Here's a logo for Soil City designed to showcase the integration of sustainable agricultural practices within urban environments. It features elements that blend city life with agriculture. Look, that's just poetic, right? So it understood what I wanted. It just had trouble with the execution. We're going to get that fixed. So anyway, I think we have a logo for uh, Soil City USA. And um, somebody just needs to figure out what are the criteria for having a soil city, what you have to do and be in order to qualify, and, and then uh, how do we begin to market that to cities around the world, around the country. Uh, one of the things you may have seen in the book is my mention of soil in entertainment. I think this is really important. If you look at the evidence of how we've changed cultural norms and values, TV, movies, and more recently, the internet have had an enormous impact on what young people in particular, but all of us think about all sorts of issues. Uh, Norman Lear uh, recently uh, died, but before he died, he was one of the great activists in this, using his TV uh, work to change societal norms. And he first discovered this when he was writing Happy Days, which apparently um, the Fonz main character, you may have heard of, uh, goes to the library in uh, one of the episodes to pick up girls. And they found that in the ensuing two weeks after that episode was, was aired, there was a 500% increase in the application for library cards. <laughs> and so that was the beginning of this whole field, which is now many decades old, uh, that shows that we can have a pretty big impact on what people think. And so one of my, my uh, young interns in the White House came to me one day and he said, you know, I think we need the day after tomorrow for soil. If you've seen that movie, it's about climate change. And it, it was from 2004, Dennis Quaid film. And I loved it just because the scientist is the hero and you know, how often do we see that? But it also was the introduction of climate change to the public in a way that nothing else did. Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth came out about the same time and had a minuscule effect on what people thought about climate change compared to this fictional story of, uh, yes, uh, unreasonable science fiction disaster, 
Um, and although there's a debate in the White House about whether it could happen, there's some science in there that I guess people ignore. Um, but in fact, people began to realize what a disaster this could be. <clears throat> yes, it's not going to happen overnight. We're Statue of Liberty is encased in ice in minutes, but yes, it, it is going to shake the earth um, and we need to take it seriously. So one of my students uh, or my intern actually came up with, uh, you know, the, the sketch. I'll, I'll show you in a second the, the, the screenplay. But in the meantime, you know, I found there, there actually is a lot about soil in entertainment. The big one that probably everyone's heard of is Rapes of Wrath, which uh, came out of the disaster of the Dust Bowl. It came out in 1939. And it was John Steinbeck's answer to uh, to just the incredible anguish that was accompanying um, this soil disaster. Well, it doesn't take for that disaster to happen to write the next Grapes of Wrath. And there have been a few uh, that that have come out. Uh, one that I, I focused on a lot in the White House was The Martian, which was President Obama's favorite film of 2015. And soil is a hero there because we can't grow crops in space without soil. And Matt Damon does a great job of explaining that uh, and the science to the audience. Uh, and that came from a book by um, Andy Weir. And there have been several others. Um, Kristen Hanner wrote an update of uh, Greg's of Wrath from women's uh, standpoints called The Four Winds. Uh, there was a documentary, Just the Ground, that Woody Harrelson and Tom Brady started. Um, it was kind of charming. One of my colleagues, I had had a large argument about the importance of soil risk. He just wouldn't accept it. And about six months later, I got an email from him saying, I saw this movie. You really should see it. Call this <laughs> thing now. You know, I think you should do something about soil. And he's saying, Tom Brady and Woody Harrelson suddenly have credibility. I don't know. Well, it takes a lot now. Um, and then uh, even, I think, while I was in the White House, Interstellar came out, which was about banning the Earth and going, looking elsewhere for planets where crops could grow because we used up our soil. So there's been a little bit of this, but there hasn't been enough. So the movie that uh, my intern suggested and that several members of my family have been um, have been enhancing ever since is uh, The Ground Beneath, also called Ground Wars, and basically the story of uh, a White House aide who is um, warning the government about uh, the loss of soil, nobody's believing it, you know, a little autobiographical. <laughs> and then uh, one summer, the massive storms that are quite likely to happen uh, devastate soil in Iowa and other places in the Midwest, wash away many, many, many tons of soil, and it becomes a total environmental and food disaster. And uh, there are all sorts of other political intrigues that um, my husband Casey has written into it to make it uh, very timely. Um, my group has tried in collaboration with a, a colleague, Karen Schloss, uh, to develop a video game uh, about saving soil, where the challenge is to uh, either go back in time and treat soil differently or the same as we have and see what the outcomes are, the goal being the deepest, richest soil you can get. Um, I, I was skeptical that you know any kid would play this, and then she showed me this um, game called Plant Zombies, which apparently is one of the 30 top video games in the world, and it's basically all about plants. And so she said, yeah, this can be done. Uh, we haven't been able to get funding for that one, so that hasn't happened. And then a hit song, which I thought, okay, that's a stretch, right? We tried to reach Matt Damon when I was in the White House, given his role in Martian, but maybe he could be the poster boy for soil. It's hard to reach a lot of these people, but I had a pretty extraordinary experience last week that might actually lead to something. And I was invited to a discussion of soil by about a dozen um, soil scientists in Las Vegas. And one of the reasons that they wanted to have this meeting and the reason they had it in Las Vegas was that it turns out that Bono, the lead singer of YouTube, uh, has taken on soil and soil and climate, that relationship, as his, uh, and particularly soil microbes, I should mention, um, he has taken that on as one of his next um, environmental challenges. And he's been pretty influential with governments and uh, people around the world, uh, the UN, in changing environmental attitudes. 
And so um, they invited Bono and, and his colleagues invited us out to Vegas to have this meeting. We had the meeting. Bono couldn't come to the meeting because apparently the day of the concert, he doesn't talk at all. Um, but we did have uh, The Edge, who was uh, his lead guitar player on the left there, come to our meeting and hear our recommendations and discuss them. And he is so smart and so impressive. It is a very, very experience to have a rock star ask for your autograph. He has to get an autograph in my book. <laughs> and he's uh, charming and funny and listens and learns and asks a lot of questions. So I, I picked up some real intense interest there. And then they invited us to their concert. Uh, we went to their concert, and a couple of us had the opportunity to meet with both the Edge and Bono afterwards. And uh, there is there's definitely serious uh, interest in soil. So one of my colleagues said, well, let's ask them to write a song about soil. So um, if you're from Madison, you may have heard of Francis Hole's song, which is uh, Francis Hole was a soil scientist here and a member of the Friends community. And I gather they still sing the song in, uh, at the Friends meetings. Uh, and so he wrote this song about soil, the anecdote of soil alone, which is the state, Wisconsin state soil. It's not a catchy tune. Those no friends say you look it up, but it's not something people are going to remember. So we challenged uh, The Edge and Bono to come up with a song about soil, a hit that will tell the world that there's an environmental disaster here. We'll see what they do. Um, we hope to hear from them again. So with that, I, I want to leave it uh, with uh, some time for questions and uh, just remind everybody that we really are at a decision point. I think we can still do an incredible amount of good and, and reverse the, the tide and save our soil, but we have to have the will and collective will to, to do it. Um, and so what are we going to do? Is it a world with soil or without? Uh, and just to remind you of a very different time in government. Uh, I'll give you a few images of President Obama. With that, I will stop and take questions. Uh, yes. Uh, this is kind of about the 10% and, and political realities. <clears throat> right now, we hear that the White House is really worried because the cost of food is maybe 14% higher than it was in 2020. So what sounds like a small number is politically a giant number. How do you get past that? Yeah, it's a good question. 10% can be a big number depending on how you look at it. I think you have to look at it over a few years. If you look at the 10% over four or five years where we know that fertilizer inputs will begin to plummet and crop loss will crop plummet, then it starts looking more reasonable because you're looking at 10% of the crop, but you're looking at some of the, the greatest cost of production, which is nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers. And so I think it will balance out if somebody comes up with the incentives to do it. Um, and the incentives have to be over the long haul. And that's the kind of risk a farmer can't take, but the government can, right? That's what insurance is about, right? We're taking, taking risks. People are paying now for something they may need later. They need less later than you're in, in good shape financially. So I think it's feasible. Probably an economist better than I could answer that better. Uh, two part question. First, my numbers are a bit dated, but the yield in Wisconsin for a bushel of corn per acre was around. I had to say about 150 numbers years ago. Monsanto predicted in a number of years ago that they could get up to 300 bushels per acre. How does that play into what you've been talking about? And uh, finally, what do you think of ethanol? Um, well, ethanol's fairly easy. If it comes from corn, it's evil because it drives corn prices up and it reduces the amount of corn that's available to feed cows. Um, and that means more land goes into corn production, which is always a bad thing. 
Um, we have an energy center here on campus that has a motto, ABC, anything but corn, for producing ethanol. And they're working on things like switchgrass that deep root perennial I showed you as sources of um, fuel for making uh, biofuels. So ethanol sucks. Um, but the first question um, on prices of corn or production of corn, I, I think Monsanto, there's a reason their name doesn't exist anymore. I don't think they could possibly get to 300 bushels per acre. I've never seen anything like that. And the numbers I've seen for um, the leveling off of the effect of fertilizer, the effect of breeding, the effect of every cultivation method you can imagine is so incremental that I think we're actually hitting a ceiling for yields, not plumbing up to uh, 300 bushels per acre. But that's an opinion and other people may well disagree. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and also for writing the book. It was an eye-opener for me. I never had any idea that soil was as complex and also as dangerous for it. I have a question that's a little bit personal, but I hope you'll bear with it. My wife and I live on an acre and a third outside of Madison in Maine County. We have a 40 by 25 foot vegetable garden and we have uh, flowers near the house. And we use perennial as well as annuals. For the vegetable garden, um, we do rotate the crops there if it makes any difference. Mm -hmm. um, we do plant the, the winter rye in the off season there. Um, and we do compost. Um, but in the spring, after we grow the winter rye and take it out, we do till the soil, mm -hmm. turn it over. Should we be stopping doing that? Is there a different way to incorporate compost and things into the soil? Uh, it's a great, great question. Um, yeah, some tilling is okay and necessary. It's the many, many um, plowings per year that farmers do. Uh, at the beginning of the season, before planting, and then the middle of the season to get rid of weeds, and then at the end of the season, just because it smells good. And I don't mean that sarcastically, but there is some, there is a, a, an aesthetic element to it that if we can get away with one very shallow plowing, yes, that that is much better. Um, the extension people for Bay County can probably help you. Um, answer that question better, although they're not always as concerned about soil as, as I am. Uh, you know, the less plowing, the better, but on the other hand, you want to incorporate, incorporate organic matter. If you're incorporating organic matter, at least you're balancing out the effect of the plowing with what you're incorporating. We do take a soil sample for county expansion. I have, right? right. That's all right. Thank you. I feel less guilty. <laughs> Thanks again. The, uh, the issues you raise about government providing funding to be able to help uh, protect land. Uh, there's uh, an idea that was part of standard policy years ago, uh, namely based on the economic pressures of what the prices were for various kinds of crops. Farmers were, I believe, being paid not to plant crops. Uh, are they being encouraged to not only not plant the crops, but to put in perennials and protect the soil in the place of that, and to do that, and could this be more of an incentive uh, to not have the land just be open, but to put the kind of crops in there and protect the soil? Yeah, the CRP program is a critical part of uh, U.S. Uh, ag policy, and is really important for getting land out of production and into protection. There are people who just buy land, and their profit is CRP that they simply put 5,000 acres into the protection system and they plant perennials, they nurture the pollinators. They changed the policy in CRP several years ago. It used to be for soil protection and then they found that pollinators were actually the more charismatic part of the ecosystem. So they started saying for benefiting pollinators, but e either one is fine. No matter what the rationale is, the outcomes will be the same. So yes, CRP is, is really important and is still going strong. What does that stand for? Um, crop, uh, you want to remember? Uh, Retention? Oh, look at that. 
Absolutely. There are always people, including me at the university, who will talk in schools. Um, I've talked in Chautauquan, uh, Wisconsin, and I was amazed at how interested the kids were in this. I thought they'd be like completely bored, and they were really interested in soil and had a lot of questions. Um, so that's always gratifying when our, our kids are interested. I have a set of sites, if, if you write to me, I'll send it to you, um, that have really good information. I've called out the ones that aren't so good um, for children on soil. And some of it's really, really well done. Uh, very detailed information in some cases, um, maybe for high school students, and then some more similar and very visual things for younger kids. So that might get you started, but yeah, happy to help with that. And there are lots of people at the university who would. It's called Conservation Reserve. That's a Conservation Reserve. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the population of the Earth has more than tripled since 1950. And all these issues, climate, soil, agriculture, pollution, have to do with population growth. Uh, was there ever, when you worked at the White House, any discussion about that, or is it just politically untenable in light of the politics of it and the Chinese experience? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the first thing is that the soil degradation is not just an outcome of um, population size, it's partly, big part is migration. Right, where the European Americans are um, are planting their crops and doing what they do to soil. Um, that doesn't take a larger population, just takes a spreading population. But yes, I agree, the pressure is uh, that much greater. But uh, no, we never ever had a conversation except um, behind very, very carefully closed doors about population. It's just, yeah, it's not, it's not tenable, partly because if we start proposing it, uh, internationally, then everyone looks to us as the biggest emitters of carbon, and it, it just doesn't go well for us. Hi, thank um, you. I'm interested in more more information about the methane you talked about that comes from composting and um, what we should be doing about it. Or I, mean, I know landfills generate a huge amount of um, mm -hmm. uh, methane. So, can you tell us more about that? Um. I have to check my numbers on it, but I, the methane is produced anaerobically, which is, means without oxygen. And as long as there's oxygen around, my understanding is you don't get much methane produced. So I think the continual aeration and the transfer of compost or turning of compost will reduce the methane production. But there's always some, apparently, um, and it uh, can be managed simply by how you manage the compost. So if you get really good instructions uh, on the internet of how to make compost work and what kind of vessels to put it in, how often to turn it, then I think you can avoid the, the methane production. And when municipalities um, compost, as you're talking about, then, then they would be uh, doing it in a safe manner? Yeah, they, I mean, they get experts who really know what they're doing and they have the uh, instrumentation to monitor things like temperature and methane and carbon dioxide evolution, you know, all the things that you want and don't want from the compost. Um, and then they also, of course, know oh, another thing I should mention with compost is using worms, very, very effective soil makers. So those are an important vermiculture, an important part of compost. I'm wondering if 4-H clubs have been, um, you know, approached as a as a singularly perhaps important group of people, the young people involved in that. And you also mentioned the spiritual aspect of this. And I wonder if churches have picked this up at all. Well, I mean, obviously synagogues are picking it up a little bit. Yes. 
you know. No, synagogues are first. Um, you are first, uh, in my experience. I don't know of religious groups that have taken on uh, soil in this country. Internationally, there are some Christian groups that um, have taken on this, their, their theme. Um, there was a first part of the question. Uh, oh, 4 H. Um, Yes, there are 4-H groups that have done soil projects, but my understanding is that it's very local um, and it's just a decision that they have. One of the things we were trying when I was in the White House, you know, the first lady uh, of the United States is always the president of the Girl Scouts. And so we thought she would be uh, a way to get to the Girl Scouts where we could do, you know, they have this massive after school um, education program. And we thought getting soil education in there would be really effective. But like so many other things, it was a little too late in the administration um, to distract the first lady from her agenda and to change things with the Girl Scouts. These big organizations can be the hardest to change. Anything local, obviously, is going to be a little easier. Um, I don't know specifically if there's a centralized program in 4-H, which is what would be right. You're right if they developed curriculum and then disseminated it out to all their chapters. Also, I just remember Liberty Gardens mm -hmm. as a movement. I mean, that, that was World War II for them. Yeah, Liberty Gardens. Liberty Gardens. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if that could be brought back too, yep. every school, you know, every elementary school, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And I know there are many that do it. There, there are many that, that do it, and I wish they had more soil um, curriculum in, in those programs, but they're great programs, and it's amazing how many there are uh, across the country. So I think that's a really good route. Um, but yeah, I love the idea of something like Victory Gardens, where it simply became kind of a, a patriotic thing to do. And we could all engage in it as an activity to fight climate change, for example. And yeah. Joey, I just want to say that the uh, book club discussion that we had about a world without soil purely shook the ground underneath our feet. As Alan said, it really was an eye opener to all. So we collected donations um, through the website, free registration, as well as the book club to raise money so that we can make our own soil more sustainable on uh, right on this campus. And so we wanted to thank you. Without this, that would not have happened. So hopefully over the next few years, we'll see more sustainable native prairie plants. Oh, exciting. I'd love to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. So sure, that's a great idea. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> 